Hello everyone, I'm Greg Stitt from the University of Florida, and this will be the first video in a series of training videos that will try to answer the question of how do you figure out the best accelerator for your application? So we're gonna look at some of the fundamental differences between GPUs, FPGAs, multi-cores, and so on. Now this is a very complicated question to answer, and unfortunately, you won't have an exact answer by the end of the training, but I will cover a wide range of relevant considerations that will help guide you. All right, so our goal is to figure out how to identify the best accelerator for an application. Well, first, there really isn't such a thing as a best accelerator for an application. There are usually a set of trade-offs between performance, power, cost, size, latency, and various other metrics. So ultimately, what we are looking for is the best accelerator for a specific use case of an application. For example, the best accelerator for an embedded convolutional neural net is almost certainly going to be different than for a supercomputer. Even then, there will still rarely be a best. So ultimately, what we are trying to find is an accelerator that provides attractive trade-offs for our particular use case. To do this, we need some method of exploring the performance of available accelerators, often referred to as design space exploration. But that, of course, just leads to the question of how do we determine that performance? It's rarely feasible to evaluate an application on all possible accelerators, so generally, this problem is going to require some form of prediction. Now, the main reason it is hard to identify the best accelerator for an application is that prediction is a very challenging problem. It is challenging because different accelerators can have widely varying performances for different parameters, and there are numerous parameters to consider, which I've categorized into optimization goals and constraints, application characteristics, architecture characteristics, input size, and data characteristics. I'll be discussing all of these issues throughout this series of presentations with the eventual goal of providing enough insight to guide this exploration so that you can more effectively choose an appropriate accelerator for your application and use case. Optimization goals and constraints are a very important consideration that has a huge impact on the choice of accelerator. In fact, before doing any exploration, I would recommend first deciding what you want to optimize, for example, performance, power, energy, some combination of those, and any constraints that must be met. For example, you might need to use less than 200 watts of power, you must achieve a throughput of 30 frames per second, and so on. Now to illustrate some common examples and trends, I have some use cases shown here, along with their typical goals and constraints. High performance computing is obviously a common use case for acceleration. Now the general trend within high performance computing is to maximize performance given a specific power constraint. Although you could theoretically just maximize performance without any constraints, in practice, power quickly becomes an issue. Similarly, cost would almost always be constrained. Now for this use case, GPUs tend to be very attractive, assuming that they can meet power constraints. If not, FPGAs start becoming attractive, or there could also be a different use case where there is a performance constraint, for example, some number of petaflops that you need to achieve, and you want to minimize energy and or power. In that case, FPGAs could be an attractive option compared to the GPU. For embedded systems use cases, one common optimization goal is to meet a performance constraint while minimizing power. For example, real-time embedded signal processing might have latency and throughput constraints while benefiting from minimizing power in order to maximize battery life. In this case, a high-end GPU might violate power constraints, in which case a lower power GPU might be considered, However, that lower power GPU might be slower than an FPGA that consumes the same amount of power, which would then make the FPGA an attractive option. For data center use cases, one common goal is to meet throughput or latency constraints while minimizing energy and cooling costs. In this case, the FPGA can be an attractive option even if the GPU is faster 
due to the lower power of the FPGA. Amazon's EC2 F1 system is one example of this. In addition, specialized FPGAs have been built into network interface cards to provide ultra-low latency processing of data directly from a network, and Microsoft's Catapult project would be one example of this. One of the more obvious issues you should be considering when choosing an accelerator is the characteristics of your application. Now this slide gives some examples of common characteristics, but we'll look at more detailed examples in later videos. First, parallelism in the application is probably the most important consideration. This includes both amounts and types of parallelism because there are different types of parallelism that can be exploited in different ways on different accelerators. Generally, to be able to determine the amount of parallelism, you will need to determine the dependencies in your code because it's these dependencies that are what limit parallelism. Another consideration is the type of arithmetic. For example, is it floating point? If so, is it double precision, single precision, or something else? Can the application get away with using fixed point or integer precision? Does the application perform a lot of bit level logic operations? Does the application consist of combinations of all these different types of precisions? Now the answer to these questions can have a huge impact on the type of accelerator, so it is very important to understand this. Next, the amount and type of branching that exists in the application can have a huge effect on performance, because in some cases, this branching can lead to serialization or other forms of overhead. The amount of memory required by the application can also affect the choice of accelerator. For example, if the application is not data intensive, a system on chip with on chip memory might be a great choice for an embedded use case. Alternatively, if memory requirements are large, you might need a PCI Express accelerator with onboard RAMs. Or, for even larger memory requirements, you might need a host processor to dynamically swap a working set of data in and out of the onboard memories of the accelerator over PCI Express. Sensitivity to memory bandwidth, or I.O. bandwidth, is another important consideration. For example, a streaming application that requires a constant stream of data needs an I.O. architecture that can provide that data at the required rate. We'll see the effects of this when we talk about parallelism in later talks. For example, the type of parallelism that GPUs typically exploit generally requires huge amounts of memory bandwidth, which is why you see these specialized onboard memories on GPUs. Data structures and memory access patterns are another important consideration. If you compare an application that simply steps through an array with an application that exhibits an irregular memory access pattern, you're going to see significantly different performances on different accelerators. Now, unfortunately, there usually isn't some simple equation or spreadsheet that we can plug numbers into for these characteristics and get accurate predictions. But as we will see, understanding these characteristics is an important starting point for additional exploration. It is also important to understand which of these characteristics may only apply to a particular implementation of the application. For example, it might be possible to unlock more parallelism or minimize latency by using a different numerical precision for a particular use case, which is something that should also be considered. The architectural characteristics of an accelerator are obviously another important consideration. In the simplest case, you could perform an optimistic prediction by just considering the peak computational throughput of each accelerator device. For a GPU, this throughput could be estimated based on the number of cores, the clock frequency, and potentially the amount of on-ship memory, for example, registers and shared memory. For an FPGA, you could do something similar and make predictions based off the number of lookup tables, the number of DSP units, the size of embedded RAMs, the amount of embedded RAMs, and so on. However, these predictions will often be very inaccurate compared to the actual realizable performance. In addition to considering the performance of the accelerator device itself, the board architecture is often just as important 
because different board architectures have many different trade-offs. The most common category of board architecture is a PCI Express accelerator. These boards tend to have high peak computational throughput, but they also generally require data to be transferred to and from the CPU over PCI Express, which can be a significant bottleneck in some cases. Even boards that have the exact same accelerator device may have various trade-offs due to the differences in onboard memory architectures. System on a chip, or SOC accelerators, are an example that is common in the embedded space. SOCs have the advantage of eliminating PCI Express communication by enabling on-chip communication between a host processor and the accelerator. Similarly, the SOC may reduce or even eliminate external memory overhead. However, by using on-chip resources for purposes other than acceleration, the peak computation throughput of an SOC is generally much lower than what you would find on a PCI Express accelerator board. There are also a number of custom accelerator board architectures that are specialized for different use cases. One increasingly common architecture is to put an FPGA either on a network interface card or on any board really, but where the FPGA has direct access to a network. Microsoft uses this strategy in their Catapult project, which has the advantage of lower latency network processing. So without this board architecture, network processing must first copy data from the network into the CPU's memory. The CPU will then copy that data into the accelerator's memory. The accelerator then processes that data and sends the results back to the CPU's memory, which the CPU then puts back onto the network. So clearly, Having the accelerator be able to directly process network data is a much more efficient solution for that particular use case. One use case specific consideration that can greatly affect accelerator choice is input size and characteristics, because the input can have a significant effect on performance and energy. For example, small inputs might not use all of a GPU's cores which would achieve far below the peak computational throughput. Or a small input might not effectively amortize PCI Express transfer overheads. Similarly, inputs above some size might not fit in onboard memory on one particular accelerator, causing it to have worse performance despite better peak potential. So to decide on an accelerator, you often have to have some understanding of what the input will look like for your particular use case. I have one example shown here from a previous paper that illustrates this concept. In this paper, we were analyzing the performance and energy of convolution on different GPUs, FPGAs, and multi-core processors. Now, taking into account some of the application characteristics I've already discussed, we also explored different convolution algorithms, since one algorithm might work better on one device than another, and in addition, one algorithm might work better than another at different input sizes. Just to give you a little background on convolution, there are two inputs, a kernel and a signal. You can basically think of these as just arrays. So the two figures here show the best option in terms of both the accelerator and the algorithm for each combination of kernel and input size. The left figure shows the option with the best performance. The right figure shows the option with the best energy. So as you can see, the best option of both accelerator and algorithm depends highly on the specific input size. The key point here is that every accelerator option was both fastest and lowest energy for some input size. While this phenomenon may not occur for every application, it illustrates the key point that if you aren't considering the input size of your use case, you could be making an inappropriate choice of both accelerator and algorithm. In addition to the input size, the characteristics of the input data are also important because some applications have data dependent performance. So one obvious example of this would be a sort where some algorithms perform differently for mostly sorted data compared to randomly ordered data. 
Another example would be applications where the control flow depends heavily on the values of the input data. This situation could be one example of where you might see large amounts of thread divergence in GPUs from branching. Since I haven't actually started to answer the original question of how to choose an accelerator yet, I want to conclude this talk with some general trends. Now there are of course going to be exceptions, but these trends should provide good starting points when considering an accelerator. First, GPUs tend to provide the fastest performance when the application has large amounts of what is called SIMT, or single instruction multiple thread parallelism for floating point arithmetic. Basically, if your application has loops with fine-grained independent iterations, it is likely going to be a good candidate for a GPU, especially if the control flow does not diverge. In other words, if all of the threads follow the exact same control path through a function, a GPU is likely going to be a good candidate. Next, FPGAs can provide the fastest performance when a GPU can't realize its peak performance due to various SIMT bottlenecks, such as divergence, stalls, communication overhead, insufficient SIMT parallelism, and other considerations that we will discuss in later talks. FPGAs also can have advantages when working with custom precisions, which is common in machine learning, or with bit operations, which is common in various domains. For example, biology would commonly use bit operations. Another generally true statement is that FPGAs usually consume less power than a GPU. Now, it can vary by significant amounts, but if you look at high-end accelerators, the difference is usually tens of watts versus hundreds of watts. Similarly, this power advantage means that FPGAs can use less energy. Now, because energy is power times time, an actual energy advantage depends on the performance difference between the FPGA and the GPU. Now, if the FPGA exceeds or has similar performance to a GPU, it will generally require less energy. One trend that very few people would argue against is that GPUs are usually much easier to program. So FPGAs are infamous for being difficult to use, but fortunately there are many efforts to improve this, so things are getting better. For example, Intel has their One API and DPC++ high-level synthesis tool. Um, there's a variety of other high-level synthesis tools that are available, and there's a ton of research going on in academia to solve this specific problem. Well, that concludes this talk, which I hope gave you a starting point. In the next set of presentations, I will dive deeper into many of these issues and will also present case studies on accelerator trade-offs for different applications. Thank you for watching.